Folks, we're back. This is Steve Sasson and Stephanie Phillips with Veterans in Politics. Our guest is Stavros Anthony. He is a Las Vegas City Councilman, Mayor Pro Tem, and candidate for Nevada's Lieutenant Governor. But before we get to um, Stavros, Stephanie, do you have any rants? I do. Let's, okay. let's talk about the price of gas. No, no, rants. This is a rant. Oh, okay. Let me just read this. And okay. this is my rant. As reported by USA Today, nine out of the top 10 states with the most expensive average cost of gas per gallon are all Democrat-led states. California, Hawaii, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, Connecticut, New York, and Pennsylvania. It's going up by the day. Every single day, it seems like. I just drove by and see over $5 a gallon and I don't see any end in sight. I don't know where it's going to end. And grocery prices are going up. And somehow, somehow, yeah, it's push is going to come to shove and people are just not going to be able to afford it anymore. So, but it's ironic that the highest ones are all Democrat. You know, somebody called states. me up the other day and said, hey, could you take me to someplace? And I said, well, do you have gas money? Because mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't take anybody anywhere anymore without gas money. Mm-hmm. Gas is going up. I need gas money. Want me to take you somewhere? I need gas money, yes. and then it's a round trip, so I got to come back home. So I need gas money to get back home too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ironically, the lowest <laughs> price per gallon are red states. So, wow. anyway, so we have Stavros Anthony, city councilman. Tell us about yourself, Cyrus. You've been on this program 400 times, right? I have. I've been <laughs> on here a lot of times, and I have a lot of respect for veterans in politics. Thank so you so I'm much. Glad to be here. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you who I am. Uh, I'm a. Uh, I came out here in 1980 to join the uh, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I uh, spent 29 years with that organization. Uh, my first 10, I was a police officer. Uh, five as a sergeant. Four as a lieutenant. In my last 10 years, I was a captain. had a Had a great career. I was a Commander of uh, Vice Narcotics. I was the commander of Financial Crimes, uh, Transportation Safety Bureau. So in 2009, I uh, decided it was time to move on and do something else. And uh, the opportunity came up to run for the Las Vegas City Council. Uh, They told me that I couldn't win because there hadn't been a Republican on the city council in 15 years. And I said, well, too bad. I'm going to take a shot at it. So I ran against five Democrats, ended up winning. And uh, I ran for my second term. You won by how many votes? Ten votes. Ten votes. Yep, won by ten votes. <laughs> so, so when people say my vote don't count, <laughs> you, you need to tell them, yeah, it does. Yeah, I was actually behind until the last precinct came in. I was uh, behind like 30, 40, 50 votes. Mm-hmm. And then the last precinct came in, I won by ten votes. They did a recount. Recount didn't change because recounts are not supposed to change. So I ran, ran for my second term, got 78% of the vote, ran for my third term, got 78% of the vote again. Currently the uh, the mayor pro tem with Carolyn Goodman. Um, in between all that, I, uh, I graduated the FBI National Leadership Academy uh, okay. for policing, the Southern Police Institute leadership class. Um, was elected twice to the Board of Regents, which is a really part-time, non-paid position. And you are a what? Uh, I, have a, I have a master's. And PhD from. So you're a doctor. Uh, I am. Nobody, Dr. Stavros. Nobody calls me that, but I am a doctor. Doctor Stavros. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to school, and uh, I've been married 41 years. Have two daughters, uh, three grandkids, and um, um, I. Uh, a couple of uh, about a year ago, I decided to run for the Clark County Commission. Uh, I wanted to do the same thing because uh, just to backtrack, uh, I was the first Republican elected to the city council. Today we have three, which is a good thing because we have better discussions. You opened the door, didn't you? I did. I, uh, I'll take credit for that. Absolutely. So I decided to run for the Clark County Commission uh, because it's all Democrats there. And I wanted to uh, break the barrier. And uh, uh, again, they told me I couldn't win because there hadn't been a Republican on the uh, mm-hmm. on the Clark County Commission in 15 years. And you do have a couple of uh, county commissioners who actually say they're socialist Marxists. So um um, I ran and they, uh, they, they say that. So I ran. They stole the election from me. I'd be glad to get into details on that if you want to. But they do. Sure, go into yeah. details. So uh, what happened was um, I ran for uh, the District C. It was an open seat. Against? Um, 
against, uh, I, I ended up, uh, nobody filed against me on the Republican side. Uh, Ross Miller mm -hmm. uh, ran on the Democrat side, um, uh, ran a great campaign. When I woke up um, uh, after the election, on the day, day after the election, I was up 1,700 votes. So you got to put the whole election in the context. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the Democrat Party uh, up in the legislature and the Democrat governor under the cover of COVID, decided to implement all mail-in ballots, which is a way to cheat. Uh, ballot harvesting, which used to be a felony, and they made it legal. That's how you cheat. Same-day registration. <laughs> felony legal. Yeah, same-day registration, uh, automatic registration at DMV, not showing your ID. All of those are used in order to cheat in elections. And you don't have to believe me, Jimmy Carter uh, put together an election integrity um uh, uh, committee back when he was president, and that's what the committee said. It goes, if you if you want fair and free elections, don't have mail in ballots, don't have ballot harvesting, that sort of thing. So or same day registration, same day registration, yeah. And so how many days can they after they receive a ballot in the mail? Is it four or five days now? So they increased that, I believe. So what happened was, I as I said, I woke up, I was up seventeen hundred votes. Everybody's calling me, congratulating me. I thought I had won. And for the next 10 days, they counted mail-in ballots. They continued mm -hmm. to count mail-in ballots for 10 days. Oh, okay. And okay. every day I would uh, lose by around 60, 40. So they whittled it away, whittled it away. At the end, the, um, uh, the, uh, I ended up, uh, according to the count, losing by 10 votes. So you just like that number. It is. is that, so <laughs> you it, won by 10, lost yep. by 10. So it gets even worse. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the uh, director of elections for uh, Clark County uh, is supposed to go to the Clark County Commission and they are supposed to canvas the elections. Well, we do that for city elections at the city council. And that basically means uh, uh, the election director tells them everything's fine, no problems. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and uh, approve the election. So they had their uh, Clark County Commission meeting. Uh, the director uh, went to the Clark County Commission meeting and said, hey, all the elections in Clark County are fine except for Stavros Anthony's <laughs> in District C. Um, the, the, the spread was 10, but I have 139 ballots. I don't know who these people voted for. It's a, it's a, uh, I can't tell you. So I can't tell you who won that election. So according to NRS, you need to hold a special election. So the people in District C know that they, uh, they uh, know who they voted for and who's going to be their Clark County Commissioner. Uh, they voted six to one pretty quickly to hold a special election. <clears throat> kind of surprised, but they did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were getting geared up to uh, hold a special election. It would have been done in a couple of months. Um, and then the weight of the Democrat Party fell on top of their heads. I guarantee you they got calls from all over the country, Democrat leaders. Uh, telling them you can't do this because at the same time, Trump was saying that his election was stolen. If you allow this to happen, it's going to give him ammunition to to continue his fight. That that's what I surmise from the whole so thing. You're the guinea pig. Yes, I would have been the guinea pig. So uh, two weeks later, they have another agenda item that uh, to certify the election. They had no public comment, no discussion. They immediately voted to certify the election seven zero. Uh, and that was the end of it there. I decided to do a recount and it gets even worse. So recounts, as I said before, are not supposed to change. If, if the elections are fair, uh, uh, they're not supposed to change. In the middle of the recount, they told me it was a 30 vote. I lost by 30 votes. At the end, I lost by 15 votes. So the election outcome changed twice. And uh, that was it. They stole the election from me. I tell everybody that because they did. And uh, time to move on, though. There's nothing I can do about it. And uh, I've decided to run for lieutenant governor. So you said um, six to one for a special election. Yes. Who was the one that didn't want the special election? Justin Jones. Okay. <laughs> okay. So is it fair to say that you would be 100% for voter ID? Across the country, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> and no DMV yes. registration, especially for illegals, and because they issue IDs to illegal immigrants. So, Correct. and they're registering these people. That shouldn't be happening. the The election system should be set up where somebody uh, reaches out to register to vote. They go out and do that. Uh, it's not automatic. Then there is a certain period of early voting, a week or two. That's fine. Um, 
You should not get a, a vote by mail unless you can uh, show the election department that you're you, not running for secretary of state. <laughs> you know, I thought about it, but uh, there's some great candidates running for secretary of state. So I decided to stay out of it. But you, you shouldn't vote by mail unless you uh, you, you call the election department, and say, hey, I'm going to be out of town. Give them a reason right. to right. get an absentee right. ballot. You need to um, show up on that day, registered to vote, show your ID, uh, vote. And then you're done. That's the way the system should be set up. So we we need uh, the Republicans need to take back the legislature and the governor's office so we can uh, get rid of all mail and ballots, get rid of mm-hmm. same day registration, get rid of ballot harvesting, get rid of all of these. Because if they that doesn't happen, the Democrats are going to keep it forever. Right. Uh, it's going to be part of the next election, which is unfortunate. And that's what People ask me all the time, are you, are you still worried about them cheating? I says, absolutely, I'm still worried about them cheating. Right. But at least, you know, the, the, the last time, I don't think people were paying that much attention. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand the extent the Democrat Party would go to. This time we do. So we're going to be watching them like a hawk. And there's still going to be some, there's still going to be people that are going to get a mail-in ballot that belongs to their kid that moved out of state. <laughs> and they're going to fill it out and mail it in and nobody's going to check it. You right. know, so we need to get rid of all that stuff, because if we don't have free and fair elections and people are just not going to vote, they're just going to say, I'm not voting anymore. And then the whole system falls apart. So we got to get rid of this. I've already heard a lot of that. People yeah. say just in this, just after what happened the last time, before we move on from this um, subject, the machines, though, the machines and their ability to be hooked up to the Internet and being hooked up to the internet during the election. What are we going to do about that? Well, um, that one's a little bit more complicated for me. I just don't understand the machines. I don't understand how they're set up. I, I, I don't understand if they can be hacked. Um, I, I'm, I don't have that information to really tell you to get rid of the machines, not get rid of the machines. People are talking about all uh, all paper ballots. I, I don't really know that. That That's where the Secretary of State um it really needs to weigh in on that legislature needs to weigh in on. So I just haven't taken the time to really look at that part of it. But that is something that absolutely has to be studied to see if those machines can be manipulated uh, to come out with a certain outcome. And if they can, if you can show that, then we got we got a problem. We have to fix that. So uh, explain the position of a lieutenant governor. Get asked that a lot. <laughs> Not too many people know what the lieutenant governor does uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, primarily because, uh, tell you the truth, the last couple of years, our lieutenant governors haven't really done anything. And so you don't you, if you don't know if you don't see Who's them, the lieutenant governor now, <laughs> uh, it's somebody that Sisolak just appointed um, just recently. For some reason, he kept the position vacant for like six months, which was uh, kind of mind boggling to me. So the lieutenant governor is the second highest constitutional position in the state of Nevada, um, has uh, has statutory responsibilities. Number one, the lieutenant governor is chair of the Tourism Commission, so is, re- is responsible for promoting tourism and working with the tourism in an industry. Mm-hmm. Number two, the uh, lieutenant governor is the vice chair of the Transportation Commission, so is responsible for transportation issues um, here in the uh, state of Nevada. Uh, number three, the uh, 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 the lieutenant governor is responsible for the Office of Small Business Advocacy. Okay. And uh, number f- number four, lieutenant governor has Homeland Security responsibilities. And number five is the president. Uh, the lieutenant governor is the president of the Senate during the legislative uh, session. So you're missing six. Um, yeah, if the governor gets hit by <laughs> the governor gets hit by a bus, then I'm the governor. That's the correct. Most important, maybe <laughs> the most important one. <laughs> so I, yeah, Small that's true. <laughs> I just don't like talking about death and stuff like that. <laughs> Something happens to the governor, I'm it. Never know. <laughs> and I appoint my lieutenant yeah, governor. That's true. Steve Sanson. <laughs> so the the reason why I ran for lieutenant governor is number one. Uh, I'm the Las Vegas City Council. The last twelve years, we've been working on tourism all the time. In fact, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll give the Las Vegas City Council and primarily uh, Oscar Goodman, but the entire city council uh, credit for bringing back downtown. Downtown used to be a toilet. Now it's a great place. It, it's packed every night. It's a fun place to go to. So we're promoting tourism and I've been doing that. Um, I'm on the Regional Transportation Commission currently and I was the captain of the Transportation Safety Bureau at Metro. So I have a lot of knowledge and uh, transportation issues. Uh, Homeland Security, obviously, I have lots of uh, 
experience there with my 29 years at Metro. And, uh, um, we'll, and then as far as the small business advocacy, that's what we do at, at uh, that's what we've been doing at City Hall for the last 12 years is really working hard to, to remove barriers for small businesses to open and grow and prosper. And what really kind of upsets me is uh, a year ago, the legislature authorized the Office of Small Business Advocacy under the direction of the lieutenant governor. And guess when they just created that office? Like two weeks ago. Oh, wow. So the last year, it's just been vacant. Nobody's doing it. So they don't really care about small businesses uh, at, at the uh, governor, lieutenant governor, because they don't even they don't even uh, open up a, um, a position that for somebody to go out there and advocate for small businesses. So, um, uh, and, so and uh, the president of the Senate, I'm not sure what exactly that means. I'm not sure what the particulars are. I'll worry about that Break when, when I'm elected. <laughs> At least you do that. But are there, are there other procedural responsibilities? I'm not really sure. But I, I run our city council meetings uh, on a regular basis. Um, so I have a lot of experience that the lieutenant governor is responsible for. And that's why I decided to run for lieutenant governor. How do you plan to bring business to the state of Nevada? Well, you know, that's uh, um, that's a big topic of discussion. I mean, the, the, the one thing that that people need to realize is, you know, when it comes to Nevada, the whole state of Nevada, tourism is a big part of our economy. Our economy. Absolutely. It is. And, and we need to promote tourism and uh, and make sure that we work with the private sector and tourism. But we need to you know, we're always talking about diversifying the economy. We have to do that. So so. Uh, you, what the way you I guess you want to think about it is if you're a person that wants to bring a business to Nevada, uh, what are those people thinking about when they decide to bring their business and their employees here? They want a they want a, a low tax base. Mm -hmm. uh, they want a great educational system. And, and you sat on the Regents for how many years? I was on the Board of Regents for seven years. Yeah. yeah. So they want a great education system. They want to they want a trained workforce. They want to be able to hire employees that are that are trained that can do their jobs right. and uh, they they want to come in where the government is kind of staying out of their business you know let them let them do their thing without fees and regulations and all this other stuff so we need to set up an economy here in Nevada that that uh, that supports businesses when it needs the government support but the rest of the time stay out of their way leave them alone let them do their thing and uh, don't come up with all kinds of taxes and regulations and fees that's going to tell them, like in California, that's what's happening there. That's why people are coming to Nevada, because we at least have those at a lower level than California. But we need to reduce it. We, we need to reduce regulations. We need to reduce fees. We need to keep doing that. Uh, and that's how you're going to attract businesses here. Definitely. A lot of people say that, of course, our, we all know where we stand in education. And that's probably a big reason why some businesses don't come here. Also, people want good health care. A lot of people here, they go out of state for health care. So knowing those two things, how can you or do you have a plan to kind of overcome those things or have a solution to those so that you can attract more business to come in here? So uh, when it comes to education, uh, the lieutenant governor doesn't have any specific responsibilities there. But, you know, as the president of the Senate, as I said, are there are there ways I can influence uh, legislation as a president of the Senate? So um, when it comes to education, it's I mean, it's really simple. It's school choice and parental freedom to take their kids where they want to go. So if you my kids were grew up in the public school system, fine. They turned out great. Um, some Parents want their kid to go to a charter school. Some parents want their kid to go to a private school. Some kids want their parents want their kids to go to some kind of a technical school. So the parents should be able to take that money that's applied to their child for education and move it to wherever they want. So that's that's the, the way. Case, right? Yeah, that's that's the way it should be. And the Democratic Party fights that. They will not allow that to happen. And that's why the Republicans have to take back the, uh, the state legislature and the governor's office. So so a, as a, the president of the Senate, I can try to support those things. That's how you fix the educational system. It's competition. And if the public schools have to compete with everybody else, they're going to start having to make some changes. So right. it's, it's a simple fix. It's just there's a big fight over it. And they're funding. I understand they have funding, but it's not being directed to the right places. How can that be? 
We need to take back the legislature and fix it. That's how how you do it. We have uh, we we take back the legislature and the Republican Party has to have dialogue with parents on how to fix it. But the way to fix it is school choice and the parents have the right to send their kids where they want to send them. How that specifically looks, we have to get through that. We have to debate it and discuss it and pass laws. But you start with the philosophy and that's what the philosophy should be. So, so how are you getting your message across? Because the state has, what's the population here? So, I, the population in Southern Nevada is about two and a half million. For the whole state? For the whole state. Probably the rest of the state is maybe uh, 700,000. So, okay. two and a half million down here, right around 700,000 in the rest of the state. Obviously, that primarily encompasses the Reno, Sparks, Washoe County area, and then uh, the, then there's a population of the rest of the state. So how are you getting your message across? Uh, a statewide Especially race. Especially the northern a, Nevada. A statewide race. I'm used to running in a, in a district, you know, so you can stay in that district. This is a statewide race, and, and I don't think a lot of people understand how big the state of Nevada is mm-hmm. geographically. It's very, very big. So, um, so first of all, it's um, uh, the way I like to... The best thing for me to get my message out is actually go and talk to people. So I've been to uh, I, I've been to Pahrump. I've been to uh, uh, up in uh, Reno. I've been to Sparks. I've been to Minden. I've been to Douglas, uh, Gardnerville. Um, I and uh, I'm going up to Reno next week uh, for a, a couple of groups that I can talk to. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to Elko, uh, Lovelock, Persian County. Uh, a couple other places and and a lot of Persians up there. And, <laughs> yeah, no, no Persians. There, I'm sure there are some, but I don't think that's why they call it Persian County. <laughs> or maybe it is. I, that's a good question. So and then uh, eventually, uh, you know, uh, Winnemucca and Ely, and uh, so I, I'm going to spend the next three months during the primary just traveling around the state, and it's it's actually kind of fun. I mean, it does. It, there's some there's some. Uh, Tough landscapes in Nevada, but there's some beautiful places too. And getting to meet folks in Ely and uh, uh, Goldfield and some of these other places, it's it's really cool talking to folks uh, that live in those areas. So that's number one. That's how I like to do it. I like to sit down and talk to folks. That's why I'm here. Like to sit down and talk. The rest of it, you know, will be social media. Um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, those sorts of things. Um, uh, do some television. Um, all that costs money, so I got to raise. Uh, I got to raise, uh, you know, uh, our budget uh, to do all that. But uh, how much have you raised so far? Uh, I've raised almost um, almost two hundred thousand okay. dollars. But I started late. I really didn't decide to get in until no, uh, November. So I did some fun. Yeah, we had other plans for you. Yes, I was thinking about some other things. You were thinking about some other things, and uh, I kind of waited to see where all these other folks would jump in. And we got some great candidates in these other areas. So, but nobody had really jumped into the lieutenant governor's race. So, uh, on the at least on the Republican yeah, now it's side, crowded. Now there's a, so, there's uh, about five six right now okay. that are running on the Republican side. Democrat side will have uh, you know four or five too. So. Um, um, so yeah, I've raised around two hundred thousand. I have to continue raising because uh, you know television is very expensive. But you have to do television in a statewide race. Whereas when I'm running for the city council ward four, you're not going to do any television because you knock on doors, right? yeah, I'll do a lot of knocking on doors, but the, a lot of less knocking on doors. So we have a, we have a plan. We have a, a budget. I have a, a Robert I. Tobin is my campaign manager. Oh, okay. Yep, he he knows how to do statewide races. So uh, we have a plan, and we're gonna. We're going to rock and roll, and and uh, I will. Uh, um, hopefully, the uh, Republicans will select me in the primary in June, and then I'll go up against the Democrat and uh, prevail in November. How much of Nevada belongs to the federal government? Uh, about eighty percent. So, as a lieutenant governor, um, do you do you have a plan to maybe take some of that? You know, ask the ask the federal government for some of that land to build businesses on. Yes, that that's that needs to be part of. The uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor and the legislature hammering away at the federal government to release more land. They have to release more land because um, uh, because we're growing. We you can't you're not going to put up a roadblock at I-15 and tell people they can't move to Nevada. People are going to move to Nevada 
because this is a great state they're to They're running from California. And that's a big part of it. To make California the same thing that they're running from. That makes a lot of sense to me. Well, we'll uh, you know, uh, that's what people are worried about. And we're going to see the next election if that's the case or not. I mean, uh, it, it, we're, you would hope that the people coming here from California are fleeing that socialist uh, uh, state and they're coming here and they're going to uh, the, the ones that are leaving are the ones that are the more conservative side. So we're going to that'll uh, we'll see if that happens uh, in the next election. So um, but we need to hammer away at the federal government to release land because they can release land. There is land available to be released. We, we at the city do it all the time. So we're we, we work with the uh, with the federal government, BLM. Um, we just recently had them release some land up in the northwest. Oh, and where? where? Up by um, Canyon? no, by uh, the uh, the gypsum plant, gypsum plant at Lone Mountain and two fifteen. Okay. So we we get them. They're not releasing it to us, but right. we get them. Well, they release it to the state. They release it to uh, uh, for auction. They, oh, okay. They release it for auction where developers can come in yeah, and purchase the land from them. So, but we have to we have to work with the federal government and say, hey, you need to release land so people can buy it mm-hmm. and build stuff on it that people need because they're moving here. So right. we've been doing that at the city. We're going to I'll continue to do it as a lieutenant governor. Um, you, I, I keep saying these arm um, things and I went to a little Toastmasters the other day and I still says this arm. Um, you said you sit on the Las Vegas City Council currently. What what board do you sit on the Southern Nevada um, Water District Board? I do not. I uh, we do have other people that sit on the southern. Have you ever sat on that? Not the water district, no. Because I, I wanted to ask you a water question. I can. I can. Okay. Uh, you know, you go by Lake Mead and you see the the white line, and the white line keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. But then you drive around, you drive around Southern Nevada, and all these constructions going up. You have bridges. You have spaghetti bowls. You have. You got all these houses are being. Where's the water coming from? <laughs> well, um, I'm sitting pretty. Yeah. I'm on a well at my house, so I'm good. Okay, but what about the rest of you guys? <laughs> you know that that's something that we we have to always be concerned about is water here because we do live in a desert, um, and we we have to keep working on it. But a, a couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to the current situation with water. Um, number one, the water that goes down the drain. Mm-hmm. Uh, 99% of that goes to the water treatment plant. It gets treated. It goes back to Lake Mead. It's get pulled out of Lake Mead. It's that. treated again. <laughs> well, you can drink. You can drink Lake Mead water. Oh, no, no, just put right. a little lemon in it, and it's just fine. <laughs> so I'll hide the taste. <laughs> we do have bottled water. So the the water that goes down the drain is not wasted. That comes back, and it's available for use. Um, that's number one. So that's a good thing. Number two is the the conservation efforts have been absolutely remarkable during the last uh, you know thirty years with uh, you know golf courses tearing out grass. If you look at most of the development today, it uses very little water. They have this desert landscape, so we're we're not wasting the, the water that gets wasted is the water that's you know that's used outside and then. And then just evaporate. So we have a lot less of that. So our conservation efforts have been great. Uh, we uh, the uh, the water district did build a pipeline. It used to be the pipe was uh, uh, was uh, vertical. So if it dropped below the pipeline, then you couldn't pipe the water out. They built another pipeline underneath it. So you're always going to be able to pull water out as long as the Lake Mead has water in it. You're always always going to pull it out. Um, we have to come up with some other other ways to, you know, bring water into Lake Mead. But, you know, the the rest of it is Mother Nature. We just need Mother. You know, we're going to have certain years That's where we have praying. It is. Absolutely. There's one. Some years we have a big snowpack. Other years we don't have a big snowpack. The water um, during the last I mean, the snowpacks during the last 20 years have been been a lot less than they normally are. So we have to rely on them. Plus, we have to rely on these. um uh, interstate packs that we have. We have uh, water packs with Col- Colorado, Nevada, Utah, so California, right. all the way down to Mexico. So we got to make sure that we're getting our fair share. That is, California is pulling our, our water. They take most of our water, they, don't they? Yeah. A lot of it for agriculture, yeah. So we have to make sure that our state is protected so the water 
continues to come into Lake Mead. Now, there's other there's other things people have talked about desalination plants uh, to bring water. That's what I to was going to Mead. ask you about. What do you um, think about that? Well, I, you know, I haven't really studied it. It's, it sounds good. I just don't know how much it costs to do something like that. The pipeline. Somebody else had mentioned, uh, which I thought was interesting, is uh, the uh, the Missouri Mississippi rivers. They flood. There's, they have some really bad floods. So somebody mentioned, hey, why not build a, a pipeline from there to here so when those rivers flood, it goes into the pipeline and gets transported to Lake Mead. Sounds like an interesting idea. We just have to find out how much that stuff costs. And, you know, private sector may come up with some great ideas for water. So we, we the, the, the Southern Nevada Water District um, has said publicly that we are in good shape with water for at least 60 years. So, um, but we have to keep thinking beyond that. Well, um, I won't be around. So I won't be around either. So, but they, they say we're good for 60 years. So, uh, uh, so we, the, 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 we're okay with water, um, but we still have to plan for the future and plan for the next generation. So uh, that's something that we have to constantly do. And uh, I'd, I'd be happy to be part of that discussion. So here's an idea for you. You know how, you get tax credit from the federal government when you put um, solars on your roof, right? Um, the Southern Nevada uh, um, Water District gives you a incentive if you convert from sod, uh, which is the grass, to desert landscaping. That's correct. And my understanding is that anything within the city's jurisdiction is from the Lake Mead water, Las Vegas Valley. OK, but in the county, um, there are uh, like there are a lot of pockets in the county that have um, septic, I'm sorry, that have uh, well water. But the well water doesn't drain off anywhere for it to be recaptured to go into the Lake Mead treatment plant. There's a lot of people that have well. Sorry. You know what? I said that all wrong. Right. I said it all wrong. Let me let me let me let me let me going to correct you. But I let, 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 let me back up. Again. I, I, I was right. I was right when I went to septic. I was right when I went to septic. How how, how could how could you get how could you get um, an incentive program for for homeowners that have uh, uh, septic uh, septic tanks instead of sewer tanks? How could you get an incentive program for them to to go into the sewer instead of having a septic and that way they could get that that water from the septic tank well um i have to think about that but i i believe even if you have a septic tank you're you're, you're drawing water from someplace else but it's from the well it still goes down the drain into this into the sewer system no it, it, okay it, it goes right into the septic okay. area and then it goes into a leach field okay it goes into a leach field but it's not captured by the um by the water treatment program so, because nobody has any incentive to switch from their septic to sewer, I so I, that's why I was telling you about the solar. You get the tax yes. credit from the IRS and and the Las Vegas Valley. What do you get an incentive from them from going from sod to desert? But I mean, yeah. So, but but with the sewer, with the sewer in the county, there there is there is no capturing of the water. Right. Okay. So, how, how would you give those folks a an incentive to go from septic to sewer? That's a great question. I and think. the reason why I'm asking yeah. you this question because you, you're on the Las Vegas City Council right now, so and I, and I wanted to hear your 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 opinion on that. Um, that's never come up as a discussion point, so I wouldn't know how to answer that. But I think it's something that we should probably take a look at. Absolutely, mm, it's in your head. It is. It's I, in my I put head it in Marilyn <laughs> Kirkpatrick's head too. So I want to see what happens. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can bring that up at the appropriate time. But that's a good question. But my yeah. understanding is that is that in the city's jurisdiction there is no septic. Correct. You have everybody's on sewer. You have to be hooked up to the sewer. But in the county, there are pockets in the county, in, in the rurals, like where I'm at. I, I I'm on a septic tank, and and then all the water, all the water goes to the leach field, but it's not, it's not going down any drain to go to the treatment plant. So that's a lot of water that that could have been going to the treatment plant. It, it might even raise up the um, the the little white lines over at Lake Mead. <laughs> Okay, that's why we have this radio show to come up with some interesting <laughs> ideas to study, huh? All right, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> but 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 be but be you know I, I, I guess it will go yeah. hand in hand if you know lieutenant governor you you mm -hmm. could you could do something like that. I will I'll, I'll 
As you said, I'll keep that in my head. All right. I hope I explained it right. I think you did. Okay. I understand what you're talking about. All right. Yep. Stephanie. I'm going to switch gears. Stephanie, did you understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, not a, not a word. <laughs> you no. just, you, people on septic tanks, you just want their, you don't want that water wasted when it right. goes down the drain. You want it to be right. 99% recaptured, right. just like and, everybody and, else. And there's, right. no, there's no incentive to go from um, septic to sewer right now, because if you were to do that, it, the, the price to convert over is anywhere between eighteen to $30,000. But if there was some type of credit that you were getting, but probably a lot of homeowners would switch over. Okay. Sorry. Very good. Sanctuary cities. What do you think about immigration, southern border, illegal immigrants coming in, them shipping them here, dropping them off at various places across the country and all of that? How can that stop? Well, uh, first of all, the city of Las Vegas has never uh, uh, voted to become a sanctuary city. So we're not a sanctuary city um, here in the city of Las Vegas. Um, you know, it's, it, it's again, the solutions are pretty simple. You secure the border, you build a wall, you don't let anybody in unless they have, a, you know, proper documentation that they're, the, they don't, you don't let anybody in unless they're following federal law. If they're here illegally, then they get deported. Um, you're probably... There are probably so many people here illegally, you're not going to deport all of them. It'd just be impossible. It just it couldn't happen. But if you're arrested and you're here illegally, you get deported. So we ha you have to secure the border, follow federal law, deport people that are here illegally, and that will solve the problem. Unfortunately, the Democrat Party does not want to do that. So it, they're, they're by design, um, on the federal level, by design, they are violating federal law and allowing people to come in here illegally. They're doing it on purpose. I mean, right. they're, 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 they say, well, we're, you know, it's, uh, we're too busy. We can't handle it, yada, yada. It's not the case. They're doing it on purpose. They want to flood the country with people coming here illegally. Mm -hmm. And that has to stop. And the only way that's going to stop is if you get Biden and the Democrats out of the federal government and put somebody in there like, you know, President Trump secured the border and, and he, he had a great system of building a wall. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, unless you get those folks out of here, it's just going to continue. Millions of people are streaming into this country right now because they want it to happen. Right. And uh, a lot of those folks are criminals and, you know, they're they're coming here and committing crime. So it the it, it's a travesty what they've been doing the last year. And unfortunately, um, you know, it could be going on for another three years. So uh, that's how you fix the system. And what do you think about another hot topic uh, for people is our mandates and the government trying to mandate a vaccine on all of us and take away our freedoms and those things. What are your thoughts and opinions on that? I'm completely against all of it. There should never have been mask mandates. There should never have been that. I mean, you, you really think of it. Um, it, it you know, 30 years ago, if somebody would have said, hey, the federal government is going to is going to mandate that you take a particular medicine uh, and you have to take it. Doesn't matter what your doctor says, you have to take it or there's going to be repercussions like you're going to lose your job or this or that. People would have said, what are you crazy? This is the United States of America. There's no way that could happen. And it did. It's just it, it's it's amazing. And it's the it's the crazy Democrat Party that that um, wants control over our lives. So there should have never been any mandates. And uh, um, it, it's it, we're going to look back 20 years from now and see what what kind of um, what kind of problems all this stuff uh, has caused for this country and for people. And and uh, to, for for a government to tell you you have to take a medicine is just boggles my mind. But that's that's what we're in right now. So I'm against all of that stuff. This is uh, this is a country of freedom and liberties. We shouldn't be doing that sorts of sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I, I commend, you know, I commend all the people that push back on it. Absolutely. So after we and this is not a federal question, it could have been. But after we exited Afghanistan, um, America took in a, a lot of um, Afghanis into this country. Now, look what's going on with Ukraine. Um, what happens if the federal government says, hey, you know, we want to house um, all these Ukrainians? I don't know. 15,000, maybe, let's just say. Um, as a lieutenant governor, how, how, how would you respond to that? 
you know, that's a that's a that's a tough question. That's a big question because you, you know, if if you have um, you want to open up your heart, but yeah. you don't want to mess with your wallet. <laughs> you know, if 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 you're in in a war in Afghanistan and there's uh, Afghan people that have supported the military and supported our efforts, and all of a sudden this tragedy happens where you know Joe Biden just pulls out for no reason and causes havoc over there. You know, you, you, you're probably, you know, you're probably committed to help these helping these people out somehow. I mean, they, they helped our country out. They helped our military folks out. You should probably commit to helping them out. What exactly that looks like is a good question, whether they should come here or we should help them uh, go to another country, um, those sorts of things. But just to, just to flood people in here for for no reason and it doesn't help our country, doesn't do anything for us. That's something you, you have to really I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but you have to be careful about just flooding our country with people that really have um, are not going to have or may not have a positive impact on our country. But we don't really owe anybody anything either. So uh, we have to think about those sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. Stephanie, that's a that's a that's a tough question. You want to help people out. You want to have love for people. And, you know, you see what's happening in Ukraine. Um, but you know, we just can't open the door and allow everybody to come here. I mean, it's, it's, uh, how's it going to impact our country or how's it going to impact our citizens? We have to look at that first. Sure. CRT. <laughs> yeah. And our system. What do you think about? It's, it's, uh, you know, I, I've never actually looked at the curriculum CRT, but, um, just from what, what I read, um, it's, it's a racist doctrine. It pits people against people. It, it's it You're talking about critical race critical theory. race theory yeah critical race theory the the educational system should focus on reading writing arithmetic arithmetic training kids to become engineers training kids to in, in a, some kind of workforce getting kids reading ability up to speed and their writing that's what they should be focused on not this critical race theory crap it has nothing to do with our educational system. The parents don't want it. So if a parent wants to teach their kid critical race theory, by God, go right ahead. And, cool. Yeah, do it and <laughs> do it at home. Do it at wherever you want. But the, the educational system has gotten so far into social issues that it's gotten away from actually teaching our kids. And that's why, you know, Nevada's the fiftieth worst educational system in the country because we're spending more time on social engineering Instead of um, and instead of critical thinking, instead of critical race theory, it should be critical thinking. And we're getting more and more away from that because people have an agenda. They want to divide the country. They want to teach, uh, you know, the wrong types of history. And uh, we got to fight them back. So I'm against it. Absolutely. Anything else for Councilman Stavros? Oh, I think we might let him off the hook now. <laughs> do, do you have anything that you would want to bring up that that uh, we haven't covered? Um, no, I think you've covered a lot of topics. Um, most important is uh, uh, the, the the responsibilities of the lieutenant governor because that's what I'm uh, uh, running for. We've already gone through that, so uh, I think you've done a great job here. And um, all I can tell people is uh, I'm Stavros Anthony. I'm running for lieutenant governor. If you want to go to my website, it's stavrosfornevada.com, Stavros, F-O-R, Nevada. I'll spell it dot com. We're you gonna can have you do that. Oh, okay. We're gonna have you. So yeah, I, I think we've had a very good discussion here. So, um, um, Councilman Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the program. We, we really appreciate it, and thank you for continuing to come on the program because every time we reach out to you, 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 you come automatically. So we really appreciate that. Um, could you look into the camera? Mark's going to zoom in on you and tell folks why they should go to the polls and vote for you and your point of contact. Sure. Uh, before I do that, I just want to uh, tell you that I, I appreciate being on your show. I have a lot of respect for veterans and politics, and I have a lot of respect for you uh, representing our veterans and making sure that the government is uh, is staying on top of veteran issues, which which is uh, something very important to me. So I appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Do um, you want me to say what again? <laughs> oh, I forgot now. <laughs> uh, um, I'm forgetting what I said. No, uh, um, look into the camera. Okay. Mark's going to zoom in on you and tell folks why they should go to the polls to okay. vote for you and get you out of the primary, put you in the general election, and your point of contact. Okay. 
So uh, my name is Stavros Anthony. I am running for lieutenant governor. The reason I'm running for lieutenant governor is because I have experience in uh, tourism, transportation, helping small businesses, um, uh, homeland security. And I think, uh, I think I would do a great job for the state of Nevada as your lieutenant governor. Um, the uh, the uh, primary is uh, June 14th. So I would appreciate if, you, if you're a Republican to uh, show up and vote for me as Lieutenant Governor Stavros Anthony. And uh, the general will uh, begin right after that and go all the way to November. So uh, at that point, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat or Independent or another party, you can vote for me also. So um, I, I, I'd be honored to be your Lieutenant Governor. My, uh, uh, my website is stavrosfornevada.com, stavrosfornevada.com. You can go there. You can make a campaign contribution. You can volunteer. You can uh, find out more about me. My email is stavrosanthony at gmail.com. You can email me, stavrosanthony at gmail.com. And my cell phone number is 702-812-0123. You can call me at any time. And the most important thing to remember is uh, if you go to Greece, Everybody's first name is Stavros here in Nevada. I am the only one. Stavros Anthony, Lieutenant Governor, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Councilman Anthony, for coming on our program again. Um, and thank you, Stephanie, for um, special co-hosting. It's been a pleasure. Folks, that's uh, Stavros Anthony. He is the Las Vegas City Councilman currently and Mayor Pro Temp and a candidate for Lieutenant Governor. Stavros has a doctorate degree that he's going to bring to the lieutenant governor to help us with our education to bring more business here because nobody wants a, a, a dumbed down workforce and Stavros is going to make sure that doesn't happen. He's also a former Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department captain, 29 years on the force, and he's going to help with the Homeland Security, which is another um advisory board that uh, lieutenant governors sit on. So he's going to keep us safe. He's going to educate us and he's going to bring he's going to bring jobs and businesses here to Nevada. That's Stavros Anthony representing the state of Nevada running for lieutenant governor. This is Steve Sanson, Stephanie Phillips with Veterans in Politics. Until next time.